Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jay Dick, and I'm the Senior Director of Equitable Advocacy and Partnerships here at Americans for the Arts, and I'll be your moderator today. Welcome. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a middle-aged, white, cis, gay man with short, dark brown hair and a graying beard and a purple shirt. I'm speaking today from my home office here in Alexandria, Virginia, which sits on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway Nation, on the ancestral lands, I'm sorry, which sits on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway Nation uh, with respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and I extend that respect to all that hear my voice. Welcome to, to today's Advocacy 201 webinar, our third in a year-long series of Advocacy training webinars taking place in 2024. In January, we presented our Advocacy 101 webinar, and in February, we presented our Earmarks webinar. This webinar will be focused on how to obtain and conduct effective legislative Zoom meetings with your federal representatives. While we are focused on our upcoming May 13th through 17th federal Zoom meetings, this information can certainly be used for any Zoom meetings at the federal, state, and local levels. We have a great uh, program planned today, and I'm excited to get started. But first, some quick reminders. Today's PowerPoint slides and other resources are already posted on our Advocacy 201 resource page on the Arts Action Fund website, so no need to worry about capturing everything in your notes, but still pay attention, please. Please note that this uh, presentation is being recorded, and the recording will be available in a few business days on the Arts Action Fund and the Americans for the Arts website, in addition to the Americans for the Website's YouTube page. An automated live transcript is available for viewing. To turn it on or off, press the CC or closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and then select the show or hide subtitles. Should you need any technical assistance today, please put a question into the Q&A box and my colleague, Mittal at AFTA, will follow up. We hope you have time, I'm sorry, we hope to have time for your questions at the end of today's presentation. You can submit your questions uh, throughout today's webinar through the Q&A function on, uh, the, web, on uh, the Q and A function box at the bottom of the screen. To ensure that we get uh, to most of the popular questions, please use the like or upvote uh, for the questions posted so it gets to the top of the list. Americans for the Arts staff and our speakers will also answer your questions in real time throughout the webinar in case we run out of time at the end. In the event that we do not get to your questions, we'll write them down and an Americans for the Arts staff will follow up with you. And with that, I'm pleased, I'm pleased to introduce all of our speakers for the webinar. Each speaker will give a short self-introduction though when it is their turn to speak. We are joined today by a great group of experienced advocates. Nina Angelou Chunsley is the Chief Counsel of Government Affairs at Americans for the Arts and the Executive Director of the Arts Action Fund. Olivia Tarpley is the Public Policy Manager at Americans for the Arts. Julie Baker is the CEO of California for the Arts. Emily Ruddock is the Executive Director of Mass Creative. And Lauren Meadows is the Board Chair for the Kentuckians for the Arts. These speakers are gonna give you all the information you need to know to have productive legislative Zoom meetings. For our one hour webinar, we will have three uh, main parts. Americans for the Arts staff will briefly go over the legislative topics for the upcoming May Zoom fly-ins. Then we will have a panel discussion uh, on what um, makes for a great and effective Zoom meetings from our state captains. And then our last session will give you some next steps on how to participate in our May fly-ins. With that, I will turn over the virtual microphone to our first speaker, Nina Ajalutunjali, who will get us started. Take it away, Nina. Thank you very much, Jay. As Jay mentioned, um, I'm Nina Ajalutunjali with Americans for the Arts and the Arts Action Fund. I'm going to start you off because... Um, there are some primary legislative issues that we want you to focus in on now um, because of the period that we are in federal legislative activity. Um, it's gonna be about the National Endowment for the Arts and National Endowment for the Humanities, which I'll cover. And then my colleague, Olivia, will cover the arts and education funding. And we're gonna focus on these two things. 
this is now the most perfect time to be engaging with members of Congress on appropriations issues because this is the time that they want to hear from constituents. They want to hear from other members of Congress about what their needs are um, for particular federal agencies or programs back home. So in order to give you context of what we're gonna be asking for this year, I think it's important to begin with what we ended up with for the current year. So as you might know, fiscal years um, for Congress and the federal government are not the same thing as a calendar year. The fiscal year for um, federal government is from October 1, 2023, and that's for fiscal year 2024. It's from October 1st, 2023 to September 30th, 2024. Now, what's interesting about this, which you've seen in headlines over the last few months, is that Congress has been in a serious dis disarray with a lot of political chaos, a lot of it um, fueled by members of the House Freedom Caucus that have delayed the legislation from moving forward. So while this piece of funding legislation actually began six months ago, it wasn't resolved until a few weeks ago. Um, so these federal agencies are now quickly trying to um, spend accordingly to the funds that they got in the end. Um, and so in the case of the NEA, um, there wasn't going, there isn't a surprise where they got less than what they had before or more. Um, in FY23, the year before that, they ended with a good increase up to 207 million. With this political chaos that happened this year um, and last year, um, we ended with 207 million. And I have to say that that was quite a success actually, even though it's level funding for both the NEA and NEH. Um, what's circled in red was last year's funding, what's circled in yellow is what's this year's funding. And the president started off with an ask for 211 million, the house brought it down to 186, the Senate brought it up to 207. We were able to defeat two floor amendments on, um, on the house side to eliminate funding completely for these two agencies and we won it overwhelmingly, and I'm gonna be able to share those voting records for you so that when you speak with your member of Congress for a zoom in, you know where they stand. Next slide. So now, where do we stay now? So right now, April, 2024, we are lobbying for fiscal year 2025 funding. And so that is for the period beginning in the fall of this year. It's not gonna get resolved folks again um, in time but it will be resolved probably after the election in either December or January. But now's the time to make an ask because there are deadlines, very serious deadlines in terms of when these requests have to come in. And this is the right time leading up to our Zoom in in the second week of May, uh, the 13th through the 17th that Jay's gonna be talking about. So here's where we stand. I already mentioned we started off with 207 million. Um, but the president kind of surprised us a little bit and he didn't stick to his 211 asks like he did last year. And he did something else that was kind of surprising. He asked for 210.1 million, not far off, uh, for the NEA. And then I think in some kind of a math calculation error, he only asked for 200.1 million, 10 million difference for the NEH. We didn't like that. We believe that these two federal agencies should be treated as the twin agencies that they were created upon. So we are going back and asking for 211 million. And here's who all of us have to help us with that support. We worked with the National Arts Service Organizations representing every discipline under the sun, which also involved many state arts advocacy organizations, state arts agencies, um, to reach a, a consensus among us. So we're all on a united same page of asking for 211. But before we came out with our ask, we also got consensus from our House congressional leaders who are arts champions and our Senate congressional leaders who are arts champions to ask if they will also ask for an amount higher than what the president is asking for. And I can say we have all reached consensus that we're asking for 211. So you're not gonna be alone out there when you ask for this. And let's show the next slide for some resources um, that will help you make your case. In the yellow hyperlink above is our landing page for Advocacy 201 webinar. 
all of these resources and a few more that aren't on this list have been added there closer towards the bottom of that page. And it's going to include an, a real um, elaborate issue brief for making the case for the NEA and NEH that goes into a lot more detail than I'm able to do right now that, that will give you understanding of why we want this kind of funding and what's needed and how it be used. The second is I mentioned we fought off two floor amendments last year. They were offered by Congressman Scott Perry, who is a leader among the House Freedom Caucus. And we were really able to knock those out. Um, it happened on November 2nd, and um, it was a real bipartisan vote in support of the arts and humanities with 292 Republicans and Democrats voting against an amendment that would have tried to eliminate funding for the NEA and NEH. We have the, the way every House member voted on these two amendments on this resource page. There isn't something like that for the Senate, so you'll just have to rely on the House for this part. But the next thing, number three, is a list of House and Senate members who signed what's called a Dear Colleague letter, which is an official letter that goes from one House member to another House member or one Senator to another Senator saying, I think that the funding for the NEA and NEH should be 211 million. Will you join me in this letter and signing on to send it to the appropriate subcommittee, in this case, the Interior Appropriations Subcommittee, and agree with us so that we can show a united front that a great number of members of Congress want this as well. We're showing, um, that list is now happening right now as we speak um, for members to sign on. So I'm going to show you last year's letter of who signed on to those letters so that you can have a good understanding before you go into the meeting. If you're talking to an arts champion or someone who needs to be convinced to be an arts champion. And then finally, um, we have updated our 2024 Why the Arts Matter fact sheets. And on the next slide, I'm gonna show you a little bit more of that detail. Um, these are literally just updated today um, for all 50 states plus the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. And here I'm just giving you one example showcasing New Jersey. And it is going to have the latest Bureau of Economic Analysis numbers for GDP um, for the arts and culture sector that were just released by the National Endowment for the Arts last month. And it gives it for the federal numbers in the blue column and the state numbers in the green column. Below that are economic impact numbers of only the nonprofit industry. What's above their GDP is for the nonprofit and for profit. Economic impact numbers are only for the nonprofit. And then finally, in the last um, set row, is about what is the current funding for the arts at the NEA and the NEH? What is the current funding within your state as well? Because your members of Congress are just as interested in the state issues as they are the federal issues. And on the flip page of these fact sheets are some great anecdotal information about cultural organizations in your state and who some of the state arts leaders are, many of whom will be leading these Zoom in call week um, meetings for um, all of you. Um, with that, I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague, Olivia Tarpley, to walk you through the arts education legislative ask. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Nina, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Olivia Tarpley, and I'm the public policy manager here at Americans for the Arts. I'm a white woman with wavy dark brown hair, and I'm wearing an animal print blouse. I'm calling in from Americans for the Arts office in downtown Washington, DC, which sits on the unceded and traditional lands of the Anacostan people. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today to discuss arts education advocacy ahead of our first National Arts Advocacy Zoom in week. Today, I'm going to review fiscal year 2024, discuss our fiscal year 2025 asks, and go over the Arts Education for All Act. Like Nina said, an up the FY24 appropriations were passed in mid-March and most of the funding remained level from FY23. The Assistance for Arts Education program was funded at 36.5 million. The Every Student Succeeds Act Education Title I Part A was level funded at 18.39 billion. Education Title II Part A was funded at 2.19 billion and Education Title IV Part A was funded at 1.38 billion. Now let's talk about FY25. 
I'll go over our asks briefly and then provide some more context and history for what these programs fund and why they're important. We're asking for 40 million for the Assistance for Arts Education program, 20.5 billion for Education Title I Part A, 3 billion for Education Title II Part A, and 1.65 billion for Education Title IV Part A. The Assistance for Arts Education program is a grant program that promotes arts education for students, and this includes students from low-income families and students with disabilities. Funding for this program supports professional development for arts educators, teachers, and principals, the development and distribution of accessible instructional materials, and community and national outreach that strengthens partnerships among schools, local education agencies, and other community organizations. The $40 million ask in FY25 is a modest increase and the arts education community is coalescing around this ask. In 2015, the Every Student Succeeds Act, also known as ESSA, was signed into law and it's the most recent iteration of K through 12 federal law for education. Previously, No Child Left Behind was the federal law for K through 12 education. No Child Left Behind named 10 core subjects, but only some of those core subjects were tested, making the other subjects less of a priority. One of those subjects that became less of a priority was the arts. And when arts weren't tested on, um, they received less attention from administrators, which often resulted in less funding and resources. When ESSA became law in 2015, it implemented 22 subjects that comprised a well-rounded education and this included the arts. Within ESSA, there are funding streams for a well-rounded education, and that includes parts of education titles one, two, and four. And this leads us into our other funding asks for FY25. Americans for the Arts supports a well-rounded education, and this includes adequately funding titles one, two, and four. Like I mentioned, we're advocating for 20.5 billion for education title one, part A, and this was the president's request in FY24, but President Biden requested a lower amount for FY25. We, of course, would like to see it funded at the higher amount. This part of ESSA is for grants that target schools with high numbers of students from low-income families with the goal of increasing their academic achievement. Our next ask is for $3 billion for Education Title II Part A. This funding is all about professional development for teachers, principals, and other school leaders. For example, your local public school's art or music teacher could use these funds to attend a conference to refine new skills or bring back a new learning technique to benefit their students. Our next ask is for $1.65 billion for Education Title IV Part A. ESSA authorizes Title IV Part A for this amount, but it's not always funded at 1.65 billion. This section of ESSA is for student support services and academic enrichment. Student support can include services and opportunities like counseling, as well as activities that use music and the arts as tools to support student success. So now that we've covered the arts education funding asks for FY25, let's turn to a policy issue that you all can advocate for during your May Zoom in meetings. The Arts Education for All Act was introduced by Representative Suzanne Bonamici of Oregon, and it expands arts education and programming across early childhood education through K through 12, as well as programming for youth and adults in the justice system. Specifically, the bill allows childcare and development block grant funding to be used for activities that includes arts programming. The bill also addresses arts programming in elementary and secondary schools by directing states to include information on arts programs in their state plans and incorporating information on how they'll integrate arts education instruction into curriculum and increase the number of art teachers in schools. The bill also requires state report cards to include information on arts courses and it allows for certain funds to be used for professional development for art teachers. The bill also includes a directive for research and evaluation. One of the ways that the bill states evaluation should take place 
is through the National Assessment of Educational Progress, including a specified arts assessment, which was eliminated in 2019. In addition, the bill directs the research branches of the Department of Education to carry out research on the use of arts and arts education in elementary and secondary schools. The bill requires a state's juvenile justice and delinquency plan to describe how the state will coordinate services for juvenile justice and delinquency prevention with arts agencies and other arts organizations. This is one of the most comprehensive arts education bills introduced in Congress, so please make sure to incorporate advocacy for this legislation into your Zoom in meetings. And a quick note that this bill has only been introduced on the House side. So while you're meeting with House members, encourage them to co-sponsor the legislation. If you're taking a meeting um, with a Senate office, encourage them to introduce similar legislation on the Senate side. So now that we've discussed the arts education issues that you all can advocate for on the Hill, we're gonna turn to our panel to discuss some of their advocacy strategies. Our panelists, Laurie, Emily, and Julie are all state captains with Americans for the Arts State and District Captains Program. And this means that they impact federal advocacy efforts by building and maintaining relationships with their state's congressional delegation to Congress. We thank you all so much for sharing your time and expertise with us today. And we'll get started by talking about how your advocacy efforts have changed and evolved post COVID. Have, and even considering if some of your advocacy strategies have remained the same. So we'll go ahead and bring our panelists on and um, get started. Awesome, welcome everyone. So Julie, we'll get started with you. How has your advocacy changed um, and evolved post COVID? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, Julie Baker, she, her pronouns coming from the unceded land of Nevada City Rancheria Nisanon, otherwise known as Nevada City, California. White middle-aged lady with long blonde dyed hair and big red glasses. Um, and uh, how's it changed? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, obviously uh, during COVID, there was an incredible sense of urgency, right? Things were shut down. Um, and, and then it I think what we realize is that it's still urgent, right? And that we have to be consistent. And if we're not consistent, we're not gonna continue to see any um, increased funding. But I also think that we went from relief to recovery, right? That was sort of like how we've been moving. And now we're into what sustained funding look like because these sort of one time coming into a community specifically, also when we walk into communities that have historically not received funding for a long time, and then we we drop in, give them all sorts of money, and then we leave again, we're actually learning how that is causing harm, right? And so we really need to be advocating for consistent and sustained funding uh, throughout. So that's, that's what I see in terms of um, how have we changed and evolved post COVID specifically in terms of zoom, I think you wanted to, to address how we're working on zoom. Um, you know, obviously, during COVID, that's all that we did, we spent a, a, you know, I can't even imagine how many hours I spent on zoom on a daily during COVID. And it continues post COVID because it is obviously an easier way to access folks. Um, some of the tips and tricks that I use um, are actually you can see it on my screen right now. One is to have a background. Um, I think a background can immediately tell a story. So we're actually in Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month here in California. It's every April. So as we're doing Zoom meetings, we're also flagging our, and I can only do this every once in a while, this other, there, that way, um, our theme, which is artwork is real work. So that kind of gives us an opportunity to talk. I would suggest if you don't have a theme or something, maybe you have your Zoom background be an interesting um, venue or organization or artist from your community. So it's a talking point. Uh, the other thing is uh, I am very well known for those who see me on Zoom for my big red glasses or other glasses. I've got a ridiculous... A <laughs> lot of glasses. So um, I think, you know, distinguishing yourself, um, coming as you are, be authentic, don't need to act, look like a lobbyist, you don't need to look like a legislator, look like yourself. We are the arts, we can stand out. And um, we also talked in this is our previous stuff. So I'm looking at my notes, what you asked me to highlight. One of the things also, I think, we can do so well as artists and people in the arts is to be storytellers and to provide health and um, healing for communities. And we know that that is a really important component. We saw that at the NEA being highlighted with the Surgeon General. 
I think one of the things that we can also do is follow up with videos and things that actually sh tell the story of what we can do. So, hey, you know, I hope you get a chance to watch this video of someone in your district who is performing a dance that we hope will bring you joy or bring you healing as you enter the weekend. So I think that there's lots of ways that we can engage that go beyond um, just the one Zoom conversation. And thank you. That is, I think, so helpful to know more about how um, advocacy is changing and evolving. So let's dig into some details about how you can make an impression and have a successful meeting with a member of Congress and or their staff. Um, Emily, could you speak to that some? Happy to. Hello, all. I'm Emily. Ruddick. I use the She Series. I'm the Executive Director of Mass Creative. I live in Somerville, Massachusetts, which is on the unceded lands of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts people um, who are still actively here and are working to repatriate many of the art artifacts of their and literal remains of their people that have been held in museums in our area. Um, I'm wearing a green top, uh, rectangular glasses, uh, I have brown shoulder length hair. Um, so let's talk about the meeting itself. So one of the things that I think when I first got started, I would be super discouraged if I got a meeting and it was with not the elected official. Um, and I think that's a sort of right where we all sort of think it's got to be the decision maker um, who we have that sit down with to convince them of the issue. But the truth is, like in all of our work, in all of our organizations, there are a lot of people that that elected decision maker makes those decisions with. And first and foremost is their staff. Um, and so I know now that the secret like recipe to getting um, a yes from an elected official is through their staff. Um, the other thing to know is, is that today's staffer is probably tomorrow's member of Congress. In Massachusetts, we have Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. She worked as an aide for our former Congressman Joe Kennedy II, as well as Senator John Kerry. So that you don't, you never know who you are sitting in front of in terms of the ability and the opportunity to make long lasting relationships. Um, so that staffer's job is to take in as much information as they possibly can and to be able to synthesize it and turn it around to the elected officials. So when the elected official says, I got this sign on letter, what am I supposed to do with it? Um, I want to do it. Is there anything I need to know before I sign on in support of an increase to the NEA? The staffer can say, I just met with Emily Ruddick and other advocates in your district from Massachusetts. Here are the three things she told me. Here are the three stories she told me that those advocates told her. So it's crucial to have a really great expect, like really great relationship with that staffer if you're not meeting with the elected official. Um, do your homework. Uh, and this is something that uh, Julie has taught me, uh, which is you, if you come into a conversation and you already know what the priority areas and issues are for that elected official, and you can think about how you can um, integrate the work you are doing into some of those priorities, um, you are going to be better off. Right. So if you know this person is extremely passionate about um, early childhood education, you can really sort of like navigate your conversation and the stories you decide to tell so that it fits in with that vision of what those priorities are. Um, it doesn't have to just be like, here's how why arts education is so important for young people, but recognizing that those are the things that the elected official is prioritizing helps you a lot in terms of, frankly, making your conversation stick out. Um, at Mass Creative, our philosophy is, is that um, when we have these, when we're working to set up a round table with an elected official or their staff, our job is to shut up. And, and we are trying to make as many opportunities for the advocates we have brought together for that conversation. So one of the things we really try to do is think about the flow of the conversation and say, okay, how can we incorporate a story of impact or an important data point into each one of the introductions for the advocates who are in the room, right? So when you're going through introductions, it's not just Hi, my name is, I'm with this organization, or this is my art form or discipline, so that's very important. But you can also add, in the last year, we've had, you know, 500 young people 
come see a show at our theater and get a post-show like workshop in their classroom with one of our teaching artists, right? Um, and, and here's what we're hearing, right, about why that matters to that young person's day. Um, they actually showed up at school, right? So we know you can kind of tie those data points with a story of impact and your introduction. Um, the other piece that I, I think those are like the main things I would say. The other thing is, right, is like Zoom is a weird space to be in. Um, it's super convenient. I mean, I will say in Massachusetts, more and more state legislators are deferring still to Zoom meetings. Um, but you can tell just like right now when somebody's been talking for too long. So think about staying brief, keeping it simple, um, and then handing it back to the next person. Olivia, did I cover all of the talking points we wanted me to cover? <laughs> Absolutely perfect. You all are making uh, making this so great and making my job easy. Um, so let's go a little deeper and talk about like delivering the ask, um, especially if maybe the member of Congress or the staffer is less familiar with the arts or maybe a little bit less supportive. Um, Laura, you have a Democratic governor in Kentucky, but two Republicans for your senators. Could you talk some about how you make the case on, to both sides of the aisle? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Lori Meadows. I'm chair of Kentuckians for the Arts Board. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a white woman with brown hair. I'm wearing a navy and green print top and dangling silver ginkgo leaf earrings. I'm participating from my home office in Midway, Kentucky, and Kentucky is the native land of primarily the Shawnee, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Osage peoples. So yeah, I think it's, it's important to remember that you should never make an assumption that you can anticipate a response or interest in the arts if you're talking to an elected official if they are from a specific um, uh, political party. You know, don't go in thinking that that can, uh, you know, you can read their minds and you know exactly what they're gonna say. So your pitch is gonna be a little bit different for each meeting and that's really important. And you need to determine beforehand how it's gonna be structured and what you're gonna use as, as main points. I'll use a, uh, an example from our last legislative session which just ended about 10 days ago, um, our governor had proposed um, increased funding for our state arts agency. However, we knew that was, we have both a Republican House and Senate, and we knew that was not gonna be of interest. So if we went into um, an office of a, for instance, a Republican House member, we would never start with and the governor has recommended. That would not be one of our talking points at all. However, if we were visiting with uh, Democratic legislators, that would very much be, we are, are very much a, a split um, state in terms of parties. So it's important to know what you're gonna say beforehand. In Kentucky, we very frequently hear both um, congressionally and in the legislature, I support the arts, but I don't support public funding for the arts. So you need to find something, try and find something that either um, they've done or they might consider doing that support, that indicates support for the arts. Um, can you thank them for something? Do they belong to the arts or STEAM caucuses? Have they signed a dear colleague letter in support of an arts issue? Even something like the Congressional Arts Competition We'll use that. All of Kentucky's representatives um, participated this year, but one of them hosted a local reception, um, local in Kentucky reception for the participating students. Yeah, we're definitely gonna use that as a, as a thank you point. If you run into an absolutely negative response, don't argue. Remember, this isn't a one-off meeting. What you're doing is you're establishing and continuing and building relationships for the future. And it's really important that you not um, be adversarial. So ask what their priorities and concerns are. And if possible, connect those with the issues at hand. And you can even follow up after, after the meeting with some thoughts about their concerns 
and possibilities for alignment with arts issues. Absolutely, do not let your personal politics or feelings about what other policies the member supports or doesn't support, or even your thoughts about Congress in general, affect your meeting. You need to show respect, and you'll generally receive the same. It's um, very few times that um, we have seen otherwise, and in that case, only one case that I can think of, it was a staffer and not a member. So um, you need to it, it, think about if somebody is already supportive, you don't need to, to really spend a lot of time trying to advocate there, but take advantage of that opportunity opportunity to ask them about messaging that might make the best impact on their colleagues. This is something that's been been extremely helpful to us. Or other issues that um, are maybe important to some of the other members, it's likely that they'll have more insight um, than, than you're going to. And don't, don't waste time on making asks that you know won't be considered and try to get some kind of positive response before leaving the meeting. Don't expect necessarily, um, certainly in our case in Kentucky, that you're going to walk out with a Yes, I'm going to support increased spending for the NEA. Um, some of our members have never voted in support of the NEA. They're unlikely to ever do so. However, some of them have offered to write letters of support for constituents who are applying for NEA grants. This provides an opportunity for you to thank them and to mention it when you see them again. There's um, one of our uh, Repre uh, congressional representatives, and I thank him every single time I see him for something specific that he did. And, you know, keep in mind, too, that they might not support increased funding, but they might support things like uh, for the NEA or NEH, but they might support um, funding for arts education or policies like the Arts Education for All Act. And then, you know, if if you can't get a positive response to anything else, ask them if you can send them periodic updates on information about the arts in your state or important national issues. They're not gonna say no to that. And that really will end your meeting on a positive note. Awesome, thank you all. You all are truly the experts. And um, I do wanna just, throw one more question to you all. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, as as we're prepping for this national Zoom in week and thinking about um, the best way to to implement all of this information. Say for example, you all are leading your meetings, but you've got a lot of folks on a call, like, you know, upwards of 10, 15, you know, maybe there are a lot of advocates that are interested in participating. What would be your um, advice and how would you approach that to make sure that um, the meeting is still effective, but also that, you know, folks are engaged? Well, I'd first of all, congratulations. <laughs> you all have done a great job of turning folks out, right? Like that's an amazing amount of advocates to have. Um, I think this is where your pre-meeting plan like is just, it's gonna save you, right? So um, making sure that you have an opportunity if it's via email or um, if, you, if you're able to have like a prep Zoom to sort of say like, okay, how are we gonna go through this? We have a lot, we got 15 people. So why don't, you know, I'm gonna moderate and I'm just gonna do quick, here's Julie from Californians for the Arts, here's Lori from Kentuckians for the Arts, here's Olivia from AFTA, you know, raise your hands. And then um, deciding who, what role everyone's gonna play. So who's gonna tell a story? Who's gonna follow up and make that ask? Who's gonna follow, you know, be the one to say, um, here's some materials, or I'm gonna email you and follow up with a, you know, a note that, I noticed you, we talked about this and you're really interested. I'm gonna give that information to you. So assigning specific roles um, is a great way to kind of make sure that frankly, everyone's voice gets heard and you can move through it quickly. 
I would yeah. just say that unlikely 15 people are going to be able to speak in a meeting with a, a, a an office because they maybe will give you the most a half an hour, but sometimes it's as quick as 15 minutes. So don't be upset if you don't get to speak, but that your presence actually really matters because they're going to note how many people show up and they're going to say that to if it's a staffer or whatever it is, it's going to be noted. And that really does uh, make a difference. We just had our advocacy day here in California. We had a lot of people out in the hallway when only four or five could go into the actual meeting. But I can tell you, then they came out and took a photo. And so that's another thing you can do is you can take a photo at the end of your Zoom, ask them if you can take a picture, post it on socials, thank them for their time so that you can sort of, you know, capitalize on that moment in time and show how many people in their district care about the arts. Yeah, we always use um, written agendas with, you know, the time lined out. And if, if we had 10 or 15 people, which, you know, we have never had that many people, but, um, you know, it would be very important to be very specific about when you speak, what you say, you know, don't just chime in. And um, sometimes you'll have the uh, occasion where someone will be so enthusiastic that they just want to keep talking. And you can tell that, you know, we need to move along. You need to be able to, if you're a moderator, be able to politely cut them off and move on. The other thing that I would say is if you're doing a Zoom meeting, don't have a situation where some people are on without video because that's not effective and you know it can be really confusing so you know if someone says you know gee i i really don't want to be on video thank them and say we appreciate your interest and we hope that you can you know join with us another time but we really need everybody to be on camera for this meeting and Olivia, if I could just add one more thing too, which is that I think it's really an opportunity to talk about how the arts can make a difference and that we are part of the solution. It is not the time to talk about, you know, we're, we're, we're suffering, we need your money, we are, um, or that um, about your own program. Because that often happens too, right? Well, they want to come in and talk about their own program or their own organization. It's not to say that you don't get a chance to talk about through storytelling, but remember what the collective ask is, right? We're not here to ask just about ourselves, and we're here to really talk about how we can be a part of the solution to further the elected officials' uh, priorities and goals. Awesome. Well, thank you all so, so much for your time and all of your insights today. Yes, Emily. Yeah. Do you want to add something? I did just want to add one thing. Um, these meetings should be the start of a relationship. So if you are sitting down with someone with an office you've never had the opportunity to meet with or an elected official you've never start, had the chance to meet with, well, congratulations, you just made a new friend. And just like we steward our donors or we, as we develop new friendships or professional like relationships, we check in with them. Um, think about the ways that you are gonna follow up after this meeting. Um, again, you know, in our work, in our sector, a lot of us are wearing multiple hats. I'm responsible for fundraising for Mass Creative. I'm also responsible for leading advocacy for the entire sector. So, um, Think about that in terms of how are you going to incorporate both what are the unified asks that you want to make sure they hear about, as well as making sure they hear more about your organization, particularly if your work as an independent artist or your organization is in that um, member of Congress's district, right? You can invite them to something. You can tell them about a really exciting program you've just done with um, constituents in their district. Figure out ways and touch points. And don't awesome. forget the thank you. <laughs> I think that's the most important thing about following up is issuing that thank you to them for taking the time to meet with you. I couldn't have concluded the panel better myself. So thank you all so, so much. And I will turn it back over to my colleague, Jay. Thanks, Olivia. And thanks, Emily, Julie, and Lori. What a wonderful panel. Uh, jazz hands. I know we can't see you, but everyone's giving you jazz hands. Thank you so much for uh, that wonderful uh, panel. And you can see how uh, our, those three really know their stuff and how they really work uh, well together. So thank you again uh, so much. Uh, I now want to give you, uh, take a few minutes to give you some, uh, some other information and resources to help prepare you for your hopeful uh, participation in our upcoming 
uh, May 13th through 17th legislative Zoom fly-in. Uh, you've already heard from Nina and Olivia about some policy topics for the legislative uh, Zoom-in. Uh, but now, you know, uh, and while the panel has just uh, touched on a lot of topics such as these on here, I want to just briefly mention a few of these a little bit of uh, some, uh, one last time here. Here's some just general best practices here. And they've talked about these, as I said. Um, when you're doing a, a Zoom fly-in uh, meeting with your, your, your members, uh, whether federal or state or local level, you need to have a leader and a plan. Uh, you know, to, to go into these. Um, and the, the second one really flies into that too, have that agenda and plan out your speakers. This is where, again, uh, our state captains, the leaders that you just heard heard from uh, can really help plan these, these things out uh, really, really well. Again, for larger meetings, not everyone's going to be able to talk. Uh, so you're going to have to balance out uh, you know, the idea, maybe you're going to have to put in the, the chat uh, your name and your address but, and have a list that you can provide to the member of, or their staff of here's everyone that, that was in there uh, with that. So know that that's going to be in there. We didn't hear talk about this, I don't think. Don't overuse that chat box. Sometimes people get really chatty in the chat box and that will distract uh, maybe from uh, that the legislative staffer who's trying to listen to you or listen to the stories that is being told by that speaker. So make sure you balance that. So don't overuse that chat box. But what you can do is save the story that you're going to put in that chat box and use it as the follow-up with the congressional staff person that you're talking with. So use that as that next step. Because again, I think Emily said, this is a step in an ongoing relationship with the members there. So this is a great tool of your story to follow up. Uh, and so do that. Something that I also don't think that was um, uh, mentioned there, which is what we always see, and I think all, our, all of our three speakers are nodding their head right now. I can just see them, is always make the legislative ask. You've had a great meeting. You're talking with them. They're, the legislator or their staff is like, yeah, you're right. I love the arts. But you never say, now can I count on the senator or the representative support for $211 million for the National Endowment for the Arts or the National Endowment for Humanities. We always forget to say that or ask that question. And so make sure you do that. You might have to ask it a couple times, a couple of different ways. You might get an answer, you might not get an answer, but make sure we ask that. And then finally, report back about uh, what you've learned. Americans of the Arts is, is creating a form. It's gonna be on our resource page uh, to write back to say, hey, um, I met with so-and-so, uh, we met for, you know, about these topics, we met on this date, things along those lines. And so uh, that, because we keep track of all that, you know, and again, as we said, this, I always say this is a marathon, not a sprint. Always going on, as Lori said, there's lots of members that she uh, meets with time and time again that are not really terribly supportive of the arts, but you might see the, the it just moving just a little bit. So we keep track of all that stuff there. So that's some just some different uh, best practices. Uh, an expanded version of this page is on our resource page there. Speaking of resources, here is uh, uh, some list of resources here. I don't expect you to be able to read all, all these links here, but throughout the, this webinar, we have given you all the information you need to create leg successful legislative meetings. Um, the complete list, again, is on our Advocacy 201 webinars resource page, but here's a list of some uh, really important ones that you have here. And then uh, we hope that each of you will participate in our May Zoom uh, fly-ins. Uh, again, the good news is you don't have to do it solo. Each state will have a state captain uh, who is most often the leader of your state's advocacy organization, who works with Americans for the Arts and the Arts Action Fund on federal issues. And again, you just heard from three stellar uh, state captains uh, who, will help you, who will help you organize uh, the meetings. Uh, the Americans for the Arts, uh, as I said, uh, in, in the Arts Action Fund has created a Google form for to, to help you fill out. I'm sorry, let me try that again. It's, it's getting late in the day here. Americans for the Arts and the Arts Action Fund has created a Google form for you to fill out uh, with your information to sign up to participate, and we will share this information with your state captain. Uh, we will also send an introductory email to you and your state captain to make sure you have each other's email. Uh, the link for, uh, for the Google form was just dropped in uh, uh, to the chat, and we encourage you 
to participate and fill it out today. Your state captain will work with your two U.S. Senators office to set up a time for your Zoom meetings. And for, more, and for most states, they will do the same for your House members. For large states, uh, they might ask for some help to cover all of the House districts to set up the meetings. Your state captains might also set up pre-Zoom meetings with you or send some detailed emails setting up the agenda for your meetings with the legislators. And remember my first rule, have a plan and an agenda. When filling out the form, please make sure you fill it out using your voting address as that it's important. For example, I live in Virginia's 8th Congressional District, but I live, I'm sorry, but I work in Washington, D.C. So when I fill out this form, I will list a VA11 for, uh, for the question which asks where, which congressional district I live in because that is where I vote. We couldn't be as successful in protecting and expanding federal support with, uh, for the arts without you, the constituent. The same goes for our state captains who also need your voice when advocating at the state level. Uh, so make sure uh, you are signed up for their advocacy list or are a member of your state's advocacy organization. Please see the link that we just put in the chat box where you can find and sign up to get information from your state's advocacy organization. Mm -hmm. With that, we have a little time for some questions. And so I, incur I invite all of our speakers to come back up uh, and turn their cameras back on and do a few, uh, we have a little time for a couple different questions here. So let me look at the box here a little bit here. Uh, I've not been watching as I've been talking. So Olivia, I might ask you to help me out a little bit. Um, but um, one of the questions that I saw, uh, and I will let anyone just uh, chime in to begin with is, is there an ideal time to have a meeting with your either state or federal or even local uh, elected officials? Who wants to start? Emily, I think you're off. Uh, I, I see you don't have your, I think you answered the question online. So I'll, let, I'll go uh, with you first. And you just muted yourself back. Yeah, sorry. I mean, I, I think this is where, um, first I would say, uh, y'all on this call are already familiar with APTA. They've got great resources to help you understand the legislative process and the congressional calendar. And at Mass Creative, we feel it's our job to make sure that you have a sense of when are really great times of the year to chat, chat and connect with elected officials. So um, again, if you're thinking about at the beginning in Massachusetts, we have a two-year legislative session that kicks off in January. Everybody has to run for either re-election or election in, in November. So if you're trying to Build a relationship with a new elected official. January is probably a good time to say hello and introduce yourself or your work. Um, January is also when the budget process in Massachusetts kicks off. Um, and so January and February tends and March tends to be a good time to check in. We hold an advocacy week in Massachusetts around that time. Um, and then every two years, the you know, on the off um year, uh the end of July is the end of formal session. And so if there's a bill you're particularly passionate about, you might wanna make sure you're in conversations with folks in the spring. So those are some ideas. And Jay, I'll just add that I think every state has its own rhythm. And so uh, I think it's important for you to understand that. And if that's not something you wanna learn on your own, you have an, a, a statewide advocacy organization and go to your statewide advocacy organization. It's either on their website, or they do webinars, but they'll help you to understand when is the busy time. Like right now is a very busy time in our legislature. So it's hard to get those meetings, but at the same time, it's also right before budgets, you know, the second round of the budget. So it's uh, it's a balancing act. And then if you wanna introduce an idea that they might bring to towards legislation, you probably wanna do that in the fall, the, the summer and the fall. So, so that's something that your state advocacy organization can help you to understand the rhythm. For the year, but you should also know that about your local communities as well. When do budgets get determined, uh, et cetera, and so on. So you can start to influence there too. Absolutely. I think, I think it's important to remember too that um, you know advocacy is not just a, a once a year meeting. Mm -hmm. You need to establish a relationship and, and keep in contact. And you know it's it's always a good idea to have some kind of communication with your congressional delegation, your le state legislators, when you don't have an ask. 
you know, give them something they can use, you know, don't always make it be about something that you're asking for. Absolutely. And I really do encourage our listeners uh, to go to the link to find the the, the link uh, for your statewide arts advocacy group uh, and sign up for their list and become a member. Give them some dollars, too, because what you guys do is really powerful uh, and important for your state. So support your statewide arts advocacy organizations there, too. Uh, Julie, I want to start out with you for the next question because you answered it on uh, the online chat is, um, is it important to complement uh, Zoom meetings with in-person meetings and, and kind of why? Well, for sure. I mean, I think what Lori just said, which is that these are relationships that you're trying to develop, just like anything in life that you're trying to do. It can't be one time with a with you on a in a, in a Brady Bunch box. It's got to be, you know, building that relationship. So and I think that there's lots of opportunities you know, in the state as large as California, for example, Sacramento is where the legislators are for session. Um, and we've got folks that have to travel six hours, you know, or more to drive there. And that's not always possible. So they're also in their district, right? So figure out the rhythm. When are they in their district? Uh, you know, um, and and invite them to your events, give them a platform to speak. They love that. Give them photo opportunities. May, give them the opportunity to look really um like they are the art supporter for their community. And then that helps you to develop that relationship. So absolutely, lots of opportunities. And just remember too, elected officials are humans. They're real people. Some of them come out of the nonprofit world. They come out of, um, they start often in a place where they really wanna help solve problems. And so you come to them with a solution, they're gonna really lean on you. So become that, that local expert for them on your issue area. And uh, I think that's where you start. Yeah. And actually, we have a couple of alumni from our statewide arts advocacy leaders that are members of their state legislature that are out there. Uh, Lori, I'm going to call on you. We, we have a lot of stuff coming in. So I'm going to do some round robin quickly here. Yeah. One of our reader or listeners is asking, do you each have a go to reason and or excuse to reach out to your congressional representatives, i.e. responses to a local event, publication of a report or something else? So how do you have a, uh, an excuse to go talk to them? Yeah, we look at different things that are happening in in the state, if we're talking about state things, and say, uh, you know, something you may not be aware of. This is, you know, really important. For example, um, the National Poet Laureate right now resides in Kentucky and um, for the first time uh, was uh, uh, elected for a second term. And so that's something that's something that we use, you know, other statewide events that um, uh, surround or involve the arts. We make sure they have information about those. Perfect. Uh, hey, Evelyn, next question is for you. Uh, how can local media help with arts advocacy and increasing awareness and participation uh, in any arts effort? And then a follow up. How do you really develop a deeper relationship uh, with the media to help? And I'll go to you, Julie, because I see you nodding your head, too. Yeah, I mean, I think, right, like um, media, local media is so crucial. And I think we as a sector uh, have a real responsibility to help support them. Um, I find that for us, our more we're more interested in getting into the metro section of the paper than we are the arts section of the paper. So we spend a fair amount of time trying to cultivate relationships with re reporters who are covering beats that are outside of the arts beat. And that's, and making the case that an art, to use what Julie says a lot, artwork is real work, right? Um, you know, there's an economic benefit to our work and sort of talking in those terms. to. To actually, to piggyback on the, the other question that was asked, um, reports or like data crunching are awesome times to talk to reporters. Um, so we actually did some analysis of our, um, our ARPA recovery money that the state allocated. And we found that the money that was um, allocated to the arts sector for arts recovery, less than 50% of it was actually going to arts groups. And of the arts groups that were getting it, 8% was going to arts groups that were led or serving communities of color. And we handed that data over to a reporter and that story ended up on the front page of the globe, right? Um, and it wasn't because like, so I think there's that in, it, you know, when you can hand them data, you can hand them stories. Um, that's a great way to build that relationship. Cool, last word, Julie. Ooh, no, um, I, I just uh, would say that, you know, on in terms of the reporter thing, I think, again, 
becoming that expert that they can lean on somebody that they can call and they know that you can help them. I have a lot of relationships like that with folks across the state now, but it's really also important to save those relationships. Don't pitch them on, you know, come to advocacy day because everybody has an advocacy day, right? That's not newsworthy. You've got to make sure you've got something that is newsworthy, like Emily just pitched that they're going to feel juicy. That isn't worthy enough for the news. So you know, use those relationships wisely, but absolutely those can really help advance the your your messaging and case making. And <laughs> tag your lawmakers always, please. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we are almost out of time, so I have to kind of close out the Q&A section uh, of this here. But uh, let me uh, uh, finish this up by starting to thank each of you for uh, being an arts advocate here on the screen. Uh, thank you to all of our, our speakers today. A special shout out to our sign, sign language interpreters, uh, Cara and or Carrie, Cara or Carrie and Julie. Uh, thank you Carol. to our colleague, Kara, Kara, sorry. And Julie, thank you to our colleagues, Mattel Lyons Warrens and uh, Morgan Fernari for the behind the scenes technical help. Uh, a few last reminders. Uh, if we can put the PowerPoint back up, please go sign up today for our, our May Zoom, uh, Zoom fly ins. Please review the policy topics of what we discussed today, and please connect with your state captains to get on their list and to uh, participate with them. Please stay tuned for our AMC 301 webinar in late June, July. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, please uh, stay tuned for our AMC 301 webinar in late June or early July to learn what we need to be doing next. A reminder that this event was recorded and will be available for replay by the end of this week. The AMC 201 resources and today's PowerPoint slides are already up on the web, on the web at artsactionfund.org. Thank you. And this concludes today's AMC 201 webinar. Goodbye. <laughs>